With us today is Michelle McInerney, who presented at the SPA conference in Adelaide. At the conference, she presented a paper with the findings of her systematic review looking at behavioural interventions to treat drooling in paediatric neurodisability populations, including cerebral palsy. She's going to share her research with us now. Yes, thanks, Corey. Um, so we conducted a systematic review as part of my PhD project um, because we were really interested in looking and synthesizing the evidence to support um, the use of behavioral interventions to treat um, drooling in children with neurodisability. Um, the populations that we're talking about include um, children who have cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, intellectual disability, to name a few. Um, and what happens in, in current practice um, is that behavioural intervention is frequently recommended ahead of other intervention types such as pharmacological treatments and surgical procedures. But that, um, with, prior to us doing the systematic review, we found that it, that was supported by expert opinion rather than solid evidence. Um, so the rationale for doing the behavior, the systematic review was really um, to, to find out evidence uh, to support this approach. Um, so behavioral interventions include things like the use of reinforcement, such as positive reinforcement, the use of prompts, um, the use of overcorrection, for example, um, and really, this is really important for us to find evidence on because drooling is so common in children with neurodisability. So in the population of children with cerebral palsy in Australia, for example, 40% of children between the ages of 7 and 14 will experience this on a daily basis and it affects their health in some way. We know from previous research that it affects physical health and it affects psychosocial health. Um, so it's really important that we have um, clinical guidelines to, to uh, guide us and direct us in our practice. Um, so we were using the ICF as our conceptual framework for this systematic review, and we had two focused questions. So the first was really, um, do behavioral interventions that, um, do behavioral interventions reduce drooling in children with neurodisability at a body functions and structures level? But do they also um, improve activity level outcomes, participation level outcomes, and quality of life? Uh, what we found, uh, so in our review, as a part of best practice, it was registered with Prospero, and we searched eight electronic databases using um, terms such as child, neurodisability, behavioral, and treatment. And what we found in the end um, was a final total of eight papers. So four of these were quite old from the 70s and 80s, and four were from 2006 to 2011. And in terms of the participants that were, were um, included in those studies, 35 uh, were found in total, and 27 of those had cerebral palsy, and they were aged between five and 17 years. Um, positively, um, each study reported a, a positive outcome with regard to um, drooling or drooling-related behaviours, and seven out of the eight studies um, used a combination of, of behavioural intervention types. Um, seven of the eight studies were single-case experimental design studies, and one was an RCT, and the most common um, behavioural intervention method used was reinforcement. Um, so that was used in each of the eight studies and prompting was um, used in six of the studies. Um, fading over correction um, was also used to a lesser degree in um, single studies. So while we found eight studies and while there were positive results reported, um, there were also big methodological issues with each of the, the papers. So some of the things we found was that um, with regard to the RCT, there was high performance bias. Um, so there was an overall high risk of bias with the RCT that we included. And with regard to the, the, the single case experimental design studies, we found that they um, didn't include, for example, a randomization component. Um, they hadn't introduced blinding. 
Um, and importantly, they hadn't actually completed a systematic data analysis. So it was very difficult to say whether the effect would have a clinical impact in the real world. Um, so we concluded, um, because of the significant risk of bias with the, the SCEDs, that there was an actual insufficient evidence to support the use of behavioural interventions to treat drooling in children with neurodisability. Um, so in terms of practice going forward, really, while we can't derive robust clinical guidelines, um, what, what we learned from the review is that we can do certain things in practice to inform um, future research. We can start by really collecting good baseline data, so using current validated measures that are available, such as the drooling quotient and also the drooling impact scale. Um, we can also, um, also think about doing research in our clinical practice and, and we really um, feel and I really feel that the single case experimental design method is quite suited to, to this research and, and the stage of, of research that, that it is. So this kind of phase one clinical outcome research. So I think that the SCED method is really good, um, but we just need better quality um, SCEDs, better design SCEDs. So one of the tools that, that um, you can use is, is the, the Robin scale to help us design better uh, studies that are going to um, provide better information on internal validity and external validity.